Hey, welcome back to the show. This is Healthy Hypnosis, and I'm Paul Gustafson, clinical hypnotherapist uh, from Burlington. Been a hypnotherapist for many years, and we've been on hiatus for a while. I had to go get my new hip, so that's been installed and I'm mobile again, so it's time to get back into production. We've got some new segments on the program, which I'm really excited to announce. We have the In the News segment, we have the Video of the Week segment, and we have the Mailbag try to keep things lively, bring some really interesting content to you, and help you become more informed about this wonderful field of hypnotherapy. So we're going to go right to in the news and get right into it. Our in the news topic of the day is from CNN. It's a really good article. It's called Hypnosis, Another Way to Manage Pain and Kick Bad Habits. Have you ever been totally absorbed while reading a book uh, cooking or watching a movie? Did you zone out to the point that you were unaware of what was going on around you? Well, if so, you're experiencing what people experience when they go into hypnosis. Although its medical uses are, entirely, are not entirely understood, hypnosis appears to help with a variety of health conditions when provided by a certified clinical hypnotherapist. And these range from helping people to manage chronic conditions like pain, easing symptoms of asthma, and quitting smoking. So, what is hypnosis? Hypnosis is often referred to as hypnotherapy or hypnotic suggestion. It's a trance-like state of mind. I call it daydreaming on demand. It's usually achieved with the help of a hypnotherapist and it is, it, it's different from your everyday awareness. I like to say it's a combination of heightened awareness and deep physical relaxation. When you're under hypnosis, your attention is more focused, you're deeply relaxed and calm, and you're more open to suggestions and less critical or disbelieving. The purpose of hypnosis is to help you gain more control over your behavior, emotional or physical well-being. It's not clear exactly how hypnosis works. Hypnotherapists say that hypnosis creates a state of deep relaxation that quiets the mind. And when you're hypnotized, you can concentrate intensely on specific thoughts, specific goals, memories, or feelings, or sensations while blocking out all distractions. You're more open than usual to suggestions, and this can be used to help enhance behavior and thereby improve your health and well-being. So who is hypnosis for? Hyp hypnotherapy has the potential to help relieve the symptoms of a wide variety of diseases and conditions. It can be used independently or along with other treatments. For example, it's one of several relaxation methods for treating chronic pain that has been provided by an independent panel convened by the National Institute of Health. According to preliminary studies, hypnosis can be used for changing negative behaviors such as smoking, even bedwetting, or overeating, reducing or eliminating fears and stress, phobias, anxiety, uh, treating pain for childbirth, reducing labor time, controlling pain from dental procedures, surgical procedures, lowering blood pressure, reducing the intensity or frequency of headaches. It has a wide array of applications. And although hypnosis may have the potential to help with the wide variety of conditions, is often used as one part of a broader treatment plan. Like any other therapy, hypnosis can be helpful some people, but not others. In my experience, it helps most people. It seems, uh, it seems to work when you're highly motivated and ready to establish change. So this has been a really nice article posted in the, on CNN.com in our efforts to help educate and bring more information out from the mainstream and what's out there in the news, and there's plenty of it. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to go to the video of the week. We're going to transition into our video of the week and it's going to be a great video. It's going to run about... Our video of the week is, is really compelling. You're going to love this video. Uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. He's a nutritional biochemist at the Cornell University who specializes in the effects of nutrition on long-term health. He's the author of over 300 research papers. He spent the last four decades the forefront of nutritional research and is the co-author of the China Study, 
uh, which came out in 2004. It's one of America's best-selling books about nutrition. He's also starred in the 2011 documentary Forks Over Knives, which is really, really popular, and you've got to see it. Uh, Campbell is one of the lead scientists in the 80s, the China-Oxford Cornell study on diet and disease. He set up in 1983 to explore the relationship between nutrition and cancer, heart disease, and metabolic diseases. The study was described by the New York Times as the Grand Prix of epidemiology, the study of diseases. So let's go right to T. Colin Campbell and see what he has to say. The health of your families and friends, especially our children. I'm mean, actually here to talk about health and fact of our country. But talking about health, thinking about how we can get health, we are in a system today that is not exactly to our liking. I think many of you would probably agree that we have a health care crisis. 18% of our gross domestic product is, counted, is accounted for by the money we spend for taking care of our health. In this country, the United States has the, high, has the highest per capita health care cost in the world. We're twice as high as the next highest country. But in spite of all this money that's being spent, the quality of, of our health care, we've got to really face it, the quality of our health care in this country, according to the statistics and, and health indicators, we place us near last or last among similarly uh, economically developed countries. On top of it, we've got another problem, too. We've got more than 50 million people who don't have health insurance. And that's up 40% just in the last decade. This is a fantastic business model, I think you would agree. It really has been. A lot of people are making a lot of money. But as far as health, it's not a good health model. In terms of looking to the future of what's, what's likely to come because of this problem we presently have, if, if the tripling of childhood obesity during the last decade, or the last 30 years, is any indication, we're not going in the right direction. Especially when we think about, too, uh, the invasion of our children by type 2 diabetes. It used to be called adult onset diabetes. Might as well put the children thing in it, too. Or the 83% increase in a harsh drug like Ritalin in our children during the last four years. Something's not quite right. I'm talking about prescription drugs, by the way. At the present time, nine out of 10 people 60 years of age and older are consuming at least one or more prescription drugs on a regular basis. I'm not one of them, by the way. And I'm more than 60. <laughs> Neither is my wife taking drugs. Prescription drugs costs, on the other hand, have doubled in the last decade. And that's after we take into consideration adjustment for inflation. And on this particular point is much as we are using prescription drugs these days is sort of the centerpiece of our healthcare system. It turns out it's the number three cause of death. Some would say number four depending on how you divide up the first three. But in any case, you don't see this listed in the causes of death in most of the, the, the popular uh, reports. Something's missing. Something is missing from our system, and that's really what I want to talk to you about. I'd like to suggest it's nutrition. We don't understand it. It's confusing. And on this question concerning nutrition, let me just do a little defining here, if, if I may. Nutrition, if we think of it biologically, is actually using food to maintain health and prevent disease. And the typical diet that we now, in my view, believe is the healthiest possible diet is a so-called 80-10-10 diet. Namely, it's the nutrient composition having to do with 80 parts carbohydrate, 10 parts protein, 10 parts fat on the basis of an energy basis. And that translates into a practical message, what I'm talking about now, it's a whole food, plant-based diet with little or no other three devils, oil and fat being one, sugar and salt. That's the diet that really does create optimum health. 
And on that question concerning nutrient composition, by the way, nutrient composition is the index. It's the characteristic of food that best defines its effect on us in terms of health. And in terms of this nutrient composition question, antioxidants, complex carbohydrates, and vitamins, are, those are the key elements that really give rise to health. They're all found in plants. That's what plants really are. Plants make the these things. Animal foods don't make these things. We might see a little antioxidants in animals from animal-based foods from time to time, but that has to do with the animals having eaten that kind of thing before they were slaughtered. Fat and protein are essential elements, absolutely essential elements. It turns out that plants have around 9, 11 percent or so of their on, on, on average. Animal-based foods have have quite a bit more. So there's the distinctive difference between animal and plant-based foods. There's another class of foods that's crept into our society too in more recent decades that has to do with processed foods. Processed foods, their kind of composition is all over the map. It depends on what, how one combines pieces of the other, other groups of foods. Processed foods also are not good because they tend to be very high in salt, sugar, and fat, the three devils. So I come back to the, my main point, is whole plant-based foods that really are doing the job for us. Now, when people think about whole plant-based foods, we've known for a good long time, our grandmothers told us, our mothers told us that uh, it prevents future disease. But it's not only about using this diet to prevent future disease, and here is the kicker. Here is the thing that really matters that the public tend not to know. It's also about using this same kind of diet to actually treat existing disease. And I think this is a really important concept because it goes right to the core of what our healthcare and medical care system is all about. Here's a list of diseases, for example, that one can find in the legitimate scientific literature, in the peer-reviewed literature. Here are diseases that have been documented to be affected by a whole food plant-based diet. That is to say, this kind of diet prevents suspends, that means stops the further progression, or cures all of these diseases. We can now cure heart disease in fairly late stages. We can cure type 2 diabetes in a very short period of time. I have spent more than 50 years in this field as an experimental researcher, if you will, in the area of nutrition. And I want to share with you uh, a little bit about where I came from and why I think the way I do now. Uh, controversial for some, but nonetheless, I really believe in the data that we've obtained. Initially, I was involved in investigating nutrients on a one-by-one -one basis, and still today, that's the way research tends to work, looking at one thing at a time, just one thing at a time. But over the years, I finally came to the view, and this is really where the punchline is here, this is where the power of nutrition really exists. It, it, nutrition should be recognized as a holistic effect of countless nutrients involving countless diseases working through countless mechanisms. Now I want to share with you just some, as I look back and sort of ask myself, how did I sort of get to this place? Because I didn't start here at, in my career some 50 years ago. And I want to share with you just a few observations that were taken from my own research quite a number of years ago now, 30, 35 years ago, that kind of set the stage in a way for developing some principles that apply to what nutrition and health really is all about. This model I'm going to be telling you about in the next three or four slides here involves a, a laboratory animal model, laboratory rats in this particular case, that have been genetically programmed to get cancer. And so let's see what, what do we see. I'm, I'm interested in this particular case here to see what effect nutrition might have on that model where the genes are there to create the disease. When we feed, in this particular case, an animal that has the ideal levels of protein, that being about 20% of total protein. When we feed a diet that is 20% diet to protein, these cancers are growing well in the first six weeks in those animals. In contrast, when you feed a diet of 5% diet to protein, they don't, even though they've been genetically programmed to get the disease. This is next little bit of this, this next observation really struck me as being quite significant. Namely, when we watch these sort of cancers growing in the first stage, and switch the diet back and forth between 20% protein and 5% protein. You can see it there. 
we could get to a point where we could turn on and turn off cancer development, which is a very exciting concept. Because it basically says, and this case is protein, but basically in a more general sense, it shows that nutrition controls cancer development. Very exciting concept. Instead of thinking about genes causing cancer or carcinogens causing cancer or viruses causing cancer, what I'm talking about here in this particular case, nutrients, nutrition, basically controlling cancer development. Now, it turns out that the protein that we were using up until a certain point in time didn't pay a lot of attention to it because it was a protein that was available for us, was casein. Casein is the main protein of cow's milk. Why is that important? Well, soy and wheat protein, for example, does not increase cancer development like does casein. Here's a couple of plant proteins not doing one animal protein doing a major difference between the two. So it suggested at that particular point in time the hypothesis that maybe animal protein would promote cancer and plant protein would prevent cancer. And that came down as a fairly general statement that I was to carry through much of my research. It turned out that's the bifurcation that really led to this distinctive differences between these two different kinds of foods. Now, as I say, this is a little troubling for me personally at the time because actually I was raised on a dairy farm. There's me up front maybe, I think it's about nine and a half years ago or so. <laughs> and uh, another just a sidebar story here before I go on. I talked about casein, dairy, and so forth. And so we have a lot of evidence now that dairy is a troublesome food, a very troublesome food, not just because of what we found with respect to its ability to increase cancer. But, you know, we, my family, we don't use dairy anymore. We haven't in some time. And I suggest if we want to do it right, you know, get with the program. <laughs> so let's get back then to the model that I was using just to tell you about some of the principles that in fact affected me and my thinking in a, in a larger context as we went forward. Namely, in this particular case, we're looking at just not that 5%, 20% kind of thing, but we're looking at a range of protein concentrations in the food to see what happens. And you can see here that in the lower levels of protein, dietary protein, from 4 to 10 percent in this particular case, it's not the exact amounts I'm really concerned about here, it's, it's the re inflection that I want to talk about. But with up to about 10 percent dietary protein, what you can see is that protein is doing a good thing. It's not creating cancer. It's not promoting cancer. Protein is an essential nutrient. It, it, we need it. Everything's working fine. So what I'm talking about here is when we consume it in excess of the amount we need. And in fact, uh, most of us humans actually live in that red zone where we're consuming in excess of what we need. So 10% is enough, really is enough. And that actually, that actually is provided by a diet made up of whole plant-based foods. If we're consuming a diet of whole plant-based foods, we're actually getting the ideal levels of protein. We don't need more. But, for, but unfortunately, 95% of us, according to the National Statistics, are consuming in excess of what we need, and we do that by actually consuming uh, animal-based foods. Now, I want to just take you to just another little idea here coming from these experiments that I found very interesting. I'm just a little schematic, so just treat it as a schematic. I've, I've just sort of given you two clusters of cells. One cluster of the red cells. Those are the ones, let's, let's argue, let, let's, let's propose, they're the genetically programmed cells to give rise to cancer. The seed has been planted. The immunogenic the event has occurred. Okay, there, so there's, those are the, the cells that are programmed to get cancer. The blue cells, normal cells. So on the left, we've got a high dose, let's say a high dose of genetically prone cancer cells. On the right, we've got a far less dose, just a little bit. Now, if all else is considered equal, if nothing else has changed beyond that point, Obviously, the one with the highest dose of the genetically programmed cancers are going to get more cancer. Fair enough. The ones on the right get less cancer. So in that particular case, it's legitimate to say that genes cause cancer. All diseases really start with genes at some fundamental level. So in this case, we, we can say genes cause cancer. Sort of makes sense. However, look what happens when we get to that stage. And now, we, we, you know, our genes are constant over a lifetime, more or less. But we go beyond the genes. If we look in this particular model here, it turns out that if you take the cells in the left, where there's a very high degree of genetic concentration of the cells, 
feed them the low protein diets, you get less cancer, not more. In other words, completely just switch it. So what really matters here is not the genes. What is mattering in this particular case is the expression of those genes. That in turn is controlled by nutrition. And that is really one of the most fundamental properties of nutrition across the board, not just in this particular model, but in this particular model, it was actually a key. It was a key, it was a lead in, in fact, to a larger consideration. So nutrition controls cancer genes. It controls genes across the board. It's really quite interesting for all kinds of diseases. And so we can say nutrition trumps genes. That's my view, and we have lots of evidence now to really make that point. It's something we can do about, well, something we can't do anything about. And it turns out there's a list of these same diseases, again, that all basically start with genes controlled by nutrition. So I have a question in the current uh, contact, uh, conversation we're having now. If nutrition controls genes, then why are we spending so much money for genetic research? In my estimation, it's a rough approximation, we're spending at least 100 times the amount of funding for genetic research than we do for nutrition research. When in fact it's nutrition, it's nutrition that actually gives us the health. It's not the genes. Genetic research, of course, makes money. Or at least there's the perception of those who are making this money available that in fact it's, it's uh, doing that. Nutrition research only makes health. So it comes down to this. How do we understand nutrition? As I said in the beginning, it's about looking at one nutrient at a time. And we see that every day. The recommended dietary allowance is this nutrient, you need this much, food labeling. It's, it's actually led to a vitamin supplement industry, as a matter of fact. A 30 more, 30 plus billion dollar industry. We now know that nutrient supplements really don't do the job. That's not what we need. I like to say, let's call that an old paradigm. The practice of medicine was the same sort of argument. At the present time, our health system, our medical practice system, is, re is reductionist in nature. We think about single causes, single biomarkers, go to the doctor, it tells you how much cholesterol you have, how much blood sugar, as if these are really things that count in, in, in all by themselves. Or single diseases, that's how we give them this international classification of disease code. Doctors get paid according to what they diagnose. By our thinking of health in terms of one thing at a time, in a very narrow little context like that, what it means is, okay, well now we're going to find one thing to cure the thing. We make drugs with other side effects. That becomes the primary means of health maintenance. So I'm going to suggest we're at the threshold now. We can be at the threshold now of actually transforming the entire healthcare system and think of it of a different way. Think about what we can do, and that's really about nutrition. There's countless, as I said. We have to think about nutrition. This, this is a real challenge to the way we do research, and the way we think about things. Nutrition is not a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. It's a collective thing. We call it holism, a holistic kind of idea. It's really, quite frankly, is anathema as far as the scientific community is concerned. So that's at least my experience. But that's what nutrition is, many diseases, working as a symphony. And inter interestingly, this is simple. It's, it's very complex biology, but it's a simple solution. Just decide what we should put in our mouths. A whole food plant, which have vegetables, fruits, grains, and legumes. Don't add back to oil, fat, fat, and sugar. It's a lot cheaper. It really works. And as far as coming back to my initial, th my initial thesis is concerned, we now have information, empirical data, to actually show that if you take a group of people, I've been involved in a couple of these, these uh, tests now. If you take a group of people, give them the right food, the, the things that happen to us, whether we have a disease or not, are remarkable. You can see these things within a week or two. Cholesterols go down, body weight drops off. And I'm going to say, that should be the future of medicine. Or let's, let's say, I don't like the word medicine. Let's say it's the future of food and the future of our health. Thank you. Just loaded, loaded with information of value, and certainly nutrition is, is becoming more and more in the forefront uh, of the battle against obesity. The lion's share of, of effort is, should be involved in what goes in as opposed to spending so much time on the treadmill. Um, so we got more, many more uh, great videos coming up as we're, we're starting to integrate more uh, quality information into the show. 
Uh, we want to go to the next segment. We don't have much time, uh, but we're going to go to the mailbag to see what some of uh, see what some of the questions that have been asked through Twitter and Facebook and uh, email. So let's go to that right now if we can. David W. tweeted, uh, I've been dieting for years without success. Why does it have to be so complicated to become healthy and fit? You know, it's not complicated. And we just saw T. Colin Campbell talking about uh, the effects of nutrition and how we can use nutrition to make significant changes in our health. But we can also use nutrition to very quickly and easily transition from obesity to fitness. And by employing something like hypnosis, with these types of changes, the transition is much easier. When we control, when we become involved in the process of eating more plant-based, whole food, less meat, less dairy, less sugar, less salt and fat, the transition to fitness is seamless. And I'd encourage you to uh, seek out information, to check out videos like T. Colin Campbell, and you will uh, start to experience what uh, so many people are experiencing now, is it's control of their, their healthy well-being uh, through what they eat. So let's go to the next email if, or the next question if we can. Sharon G. She posted on Facebook. Facebook. She, wa she says, what's more important, exercising at the gym or watching what I eat? As hard as I try, I just don't seem to get anywhere. Well, I kind of answered this already, but I'll just elaborate a little bit more. Uh, the clients that I see in my office who come for weight loss, I hear so frequently from them. They're just pounding away at the gym day after day after day. They don't get anywhere. When they start to focus more on what goes in as opposed to the calories they're trying to burn off, the transition is easy. Uh, switching to plant-based whole foods is really the way to go and becoming mindful. The process of hypnosis helps you to become mindfully connected to this new version of yourself that you create every time you enter into this meditative state. So we incorporate these suggestions supporting healthy plant-based nutrition and really the body responds wonderfully and weight just, it just disappears. What do we got? Dawn, just Dawn J emailed this question. She says, I went to a hypnotist five years ago and it was a big waste of money, she says. I was thinking about trying again and wanted to know, are all hypnotists the same? Well, most definitely not the same. We all have our unique approaches. We all have different approaches in how we develop rapport with our, the clients that we sit with. We certainly have different ways of communicating and different ways of putting people at ease, guiding them into the, the daydream state, the, the hypnotic trance. So I, uh, I suggest that you uh, continue searching, and when you're reaching out to a hypnotist, you want to ask questions like, where were you trained? Uh, what are your sessions like? How much time do you spend with clients? Do you teach self-hypnosis? Do you give your clients a recording of the sessions that you do? And do you, do you stress reinforcement, home reinforcement, to make sure that the, the change, the foundation of change becomes rooted? So if you're not getting answers to these types of questions, and I hear from so many clients that I see that they've tried to make connections with other uh, therapists and they don't get a call back. So you know, if they're picking up the phone and spending the time to talk to you, that's certainly a good place to start. I think we might be all out of time, folks. I think we're going uh, to close out the show. As we're getting used to all of these new segments, I hope you're here with us, and we look forward to bringing you some great content down the road. Stay tuned in the future for Healthy Hypnosis. I'm Paul Gustafson, and we will see you next time.